Good morning. My name is um, Elder Debbie Thomas, and we are on the book of Esther, and this is part eight, part eight of the book of Esther. And I am really excited to do this with you this morning because um, there is so much in this book that is going to help us with what's going on in the world today. Esther is having difficulty in the kingdom. She has been elevated to queen, and therefore Esther is second in command if you want to say that by her being the queen, she has the ear of her husband. So in this section today, I'm going to be going over some things for those of you that might just have started out in the book of Esther with us. And any time a story is told, we always look for the who, what the story is about, what, what happened to that character, where did it happen, and when. When is a timeline of when each event happens? Some people call it chronological timeline. When, what happened first, next, and then after that. And then of course, there's always the why. Why could this have happened? When we're studying the word of God, we always know that the why is because it is the will of God. It is the will of God that it should happen this way. And these are being recorded by men of God who were given the gift to record these uh, stories. Esther is one of the historical stories. In fact, it is the last historical story. And then there's an element of wow. Wow, it said, that's not a question, that's an exclamation is that once you hear all of the story and see how God uses ordinary people to work out his plan and his will, you can only sit back and say, wow, just look at God. In this one, we're going to go through a timeline because timing is everything. Timing is everything, especially where God is concerned. It is his timing, not ours. And so therefore we look at how things evolved as far as time is concerned. In the book of Esther, there's a lot of timing going on here. There's a lot of words that deal with time. And so I just wanna go back to chapter one when we see that all of this started in the third year of the reign of King Xerxes. The story picks up in the book of Esther in chapter one in the third year of the reign of King Xerxes. He had been in, in, in um, his position for three years now and he accumulated a lot of wealth and a lot of power and his ego was being stroked because now he wanted everyone in his 127 provinces in the Persian kingdom to come and see what he had amassed in honor of the Persian people. The Persian empire stretched, remember, from India all the way to Africa. And so there was a lot of nations and tongues of different people in that Persian empire that stretched so far over the geography. In 180 days, which on the Jewish calendar, which is a lunar calendar, that represented half of a year, he invited people from all over his kingdom, those that were in charge of the provinces, to come, and he showed them his stuff. He showed them the riches and the splendor and the glory and the majesty of his kingdom. We could say it was ego driven or it could say that he was just proud of what he had accomplished in those three years. At the end of the 180 days, he decided that he was going to give a banquet and the banquet would last for seven days. Now, Everyone was there, it was a big feast, and it lasted, they ate, they drank. On that seventh day, he decided, or they asked for his beautiful queen Vashti, and Vashti um, was with 
the women, because they always separated the men from the women. The men had a much better time, I'm sure, than the women did. And they wanted to see the queen. He had showed them all of his stuff, but now they wanted to see his beautiful wife. She was sent for, but she would not come. So therefore, her not obeying the king's order to come to stand with him at his, for his guest became a problem because now all of the women would hear this story and decide that they would not have to obey their husbands. The council told him, you have to get rid of her. You have to banish her. So he did. And we come into now chapter two, where he decided, or they decided for him, number one, he missed his wife. He missed her very much. And he decided, or they decided for him, well, then get a new queen. They have plenty of beautiful virgin girls out there. So get a new queen. And he did find a new queen, and he found this queen in Esther, whose name was Adassa, who was the cousin of Mordecai, and Mordecai sat in the king's gates. So he was part of the king's uh, governmental system there in Susa, which was the capital. It took approximately two years for him to go through this process of getting the women and then the women had to come into the courts and they for a year at least a year had to be prepared with six months of beauty treatments and then six months of makeup and all those other things that was necessary to produce a person that was just a, a commoner to become royalty or royalty looking to be part of the king's harem and finally his wife Within that seventh year, which was four years from when this started, he finally picked his queen, and his queen was Esther. Esther now becomes queen, and they, they live happily ever after. If this were a Disney movie, but it's not. Day after day, Mordecai checked on his uh, niece, I mean, his, his cousin, which was like a daughter to him. and they then had an issue after five years, someone, two people decided that they wanted to assassinate the king. They had gotten angry with the king and they wanted to assassinate him. So now the plan got to Mordecai. Mordecai got the plan to Esther and then Esther told the king. He told the king that Mordecai, one of his people at the gate, not telling him the relationship that they had, had found out that these two eunuchs wanted to assassinate them. There was a hearing, wanted to assassinate him. There was a hearing and they found them guilty. They impaled them. Mordecai received the credit. It was put into the annals and the journals. And that was to, going to be held for another time. God was going to reveal that at a later time. In the meantime, a person named Haman became second in command to the king. And he was so rich, wealthy, and now he had power, the power of the kingdom, that he now wanted everyone to bow to him. Mordecai, being Jew, refused to bow to him. And so now Haman decides that because this one man would not bow to him, that he wanted all of the Jews in the kingdom annihilated. And that was going to be on the 13th day of Adar, which was the last month of the calendar year. This decision was made on the first month. So these people had 11 months to get all this information out to the 127 parts of the kingdom in their language so that they could prepare to annihilate the Jews. Why? because of the ego of Haman. When Mordecai found out and he read this, he had told Esther, Esther, you've got to do something about this. And who knows if you have not come into the kingdom for such a time as this. We pick up this story now because Esther says to her eunuchs to go back and forth with the message 
that she needed everyone to fast and pray for her because she had not seen the king in 30 days and it was protocol that you only went in to see the king if he summoned you she had not been summoned in 30 days and she said to him everyone in susa that is jewish pray for me as and i will do the same fast and pray for three days and then if i perish i perish i go to see the king remember timing is everything so now the three days are up esther puts on her royal robes and goes before the king and she says if i perish i perish but i'm going in on behalf of my people esther goes in to see her husband and as soon as she enters the doors to the court He's surprised to see her, but he's happy to see her as well. So he extends his scepter to her. And now she is um, asked to come in. She, he says to her, oh, my queen, it is so good to see you. What is it that you would like for me to do for you? And I will make a request up to half of my kingdom. That's how much he loved her and respected her she says king no 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 i didn't come for all of that i came because i missed you and i would like to invite you and haman to dine with me at a banquet that i'm giving in your honor and his honor so the king was so excited about the banquet that he said to esther Oh, yes, we would love to come, but Haman is not here right now, but I will send for him in time for us to dine with you. She left out of the court, prepared the banquet, and the king sent his messengers to find Haman to tell him that he had been invited to dine with his wife and himself, the queen and himself, that night. He accepted the invitation. He was excited about it. And of course, his ego was shining. And he says, oh, look, I'm invited. No one else but the king and I and the queen. They had their dinner. It was very pleasant. Pat, the um, king says to her, Esther, why have you invited us? Surely not just to eat. You must have something on your mind. She says to him, I will give you anything you request up to half of the kingdom. Again, the second time he made this offer to her. She says, no, king, I enjoyed this so much. Can you come again tomorrow? You and Haman, and I will have another feast for you again tomorrow. He says, oh, that would be lovely. Haman, can you come? He says, surely I can come. So Haman now leaves the presence of the king and the queen. and he is on top of the moon. He is just so elated that this is getting ready to happen to him. As he leaves on his way home to tell his wife of his good fortune, who is sitting at the gate but Mordecai. And so now all of the joys, all of the excitement, all of the things that Haman now had in his heart were dashed because he saw whom he considered his enemy because Mordecai would not bow. When he got home, he said to his wife, he says, honey, you won't believe what happened to me today. I got invited by the king and the queen and I dined with them and I had such a wonderful time. And guess what, tomorrow, she is going to invite me again. It's gonna be a second time of feasting. And I would enjoy this so much if, when I came out, guess who I saw at the gate? Mordecai, the Jew. You know how much I hate him. So she said, well, why are you making this man stop you from enjoying your life? You have me, you have 10 sons, you have the favor of the king, you're second in command, you carry his ring, you carry his shield, you carry everything 
except you're not the king himself, but you have all of his power. Why are you allowing this man to destroy everything that is good about what is happening to you right now? He says, I really, really don't know. But it's something about him that even though he won't bow, he seems to be a threat to us. And I've already put the orders out for everyone to be killed on the 13th day of Adar, which is 11, almost, well, I say six months away now. And I'm just, I, I, I'm beyond myself. I want to do something to him right now. I can't take it that I have to look at him not one more day. So the wife gives him something to do. She says, why don't you hang him? Why don't you just get rid of him? Build some gallows and get rid of him, and then you can live your life in peace and enjoy. I'm going to leave the story right there because next week will be part nine. And in part nine, we will find out if Haman decides to do what his wife wanted him to do. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this story because we can see ourselves in it. We are a part of each one of these. In our circles, we have some influence as the king did. We have some influence towards people who are leaders and maybe we have their ear as Esther had. And then with the power that is given from the king, we have life and death set in our own hands. As we go through this pandemic, as we go through all of the other things that are happening in our communities and even in our own homes, we have to realize that God blesses us every single day that we wake up and have breath. And we cannot allow people, things, emotions, memories to stop us from having the joy that God has given us. In many ways, we have to forgive others as God has forgiven us. We cannot plan and plot things that would harm others because when we decide to hurt one of God's children, even though we're one, he will deal with us. He is saying that anything that comes to us that is unpleasant for us, there are people that might be trying to attack us. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. In due time and due season, God will make it right between us. So if we turn over all of those things to him in prayer, fasting and praying as Esther had asked to do, we can be victorious. We can listen to the Holy Spirit as he helps us to love our enemies, feed them if they are hungry, give them something to drink if they are thirsty. So Lord, thank you for this story. As we find ourselves in it, let us correct, do some course corrections, and let you lead, guide, and keep our lives safe and with joy, peace, and deliverance from anything that could hurt or harm us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hope you'll be with me next week um, for chapter nine, and then there's chapter 10, and we're done. We are done the book of Esther but I'm praying that there will be some other things that we can do together as we study the word of God. Have a blessed day today, and we thank you for coming and enjoying um, this part of the story. I have a lot of people.